we're going to look at troubleshooting. And a lot of the stuff we've talked about as we went through the class. You know, troubleshooting, what could cause this, what could cause that, what's the proper, what's the not proper. What happens if we don't have a, for instance, for DHCP, if we don't have a, a, a relay agent? The router is going to uh, stop the broadcast, and we know that DHCP has half of its uh, conversation, half, half of its packets are going to be broadcast. So the troubleshooting the network, troubleshooting infrastructure services, common network issues, switching issues, routing issues, port security issues, inter VLAN routing issues, basic device hardening issues, kind of things that we've talked about already. And again, there are a little over an hour's worth of labs. What I intend to do is go ahead and do the lecture portion and then have the the uh, the labs after we get done with that. But connectivity issues with DNS. What could go wrong with DNS? Uh, DNS settings are wrong. Somebody put it wrong on a an interface, uh, configured it to the wrong DNS server, or the DNS server went down, or we don't have a route to the DNS server. Those different different kinds of things can happen to us. Uh, DHCP, somebody put it in the DHCP server wrong. That means that everybody's going to have the wrong uh, DNS server. And we know that without the DNS server, we're going to have a real difficult time getting someplace because I don't know, and I think most of us don't know the IP addresses of the of the locations that we go to, and that's what it would require. And some of them, you get there, and they use uh, what they call host headers to run multiple websites at a single location. So even if you got to the IP address, you might or might not be able to be able to see the uh, the content. Establishing the IP connectivity between the host and the DNS server, we can't get there. It's not on our network. Default, default gateway is wrong, routes wrong, we can't get to the uh, uh, to the DNS server to get the uh, FQDN to IP address resolution. Troubleshooting connectivity issues involving DNS determine what caused the incorrect settings. You know, did somebody just type in the wrong thing? Did the DNS server go down? That's certainly a possibility, probably one of the more unlikely things. Do we have a route to it. Or is there a mistake in, D in, in DHCP? There could be, but particularly when you initially add a scope, it could be. In, in DHCP configurations, you're going to have uh, scope uh, items, uh, spoke scope configurations as well as server configurations. And when you configure a scope, it's going to override the server. So if the server's right and you override it with the scope, then you could cause an issue with this thing. If it's due to a manual error, modify uh, the values suitably in the DNS server entries. And configure the, configuring these, typically, uh, particularly in a Windows environment, you're going to have a policy in an Active Directory environment that prohibits users from modifying the, uh, the IP settings on, on a device itself. A sure way to uh, have them messed up is to let users put the information in. And it's not as easy as you think. We, When we first got to TCP IP from uh, IPX, we were, and as before, DHCP was really working. We were putting in the uh, IP addresses manually, and actually I became the network administrator at a place where the uh, former administrator decided that, okay, I need all of my workstations, all 400 of them, to have manual IP addresses, and the the IT the yeah anyway the the director the department head oh yeah we have to have we have to have them so we know where they are well, I never could find a mapping for them but that's what DNS does for us DHCP gives the address and they work together with DNS and Active Directory environment so that we can find out where those things are uh, manual addresses and when we again back to when we first doing we were putting them in we had a piece of paper had all of our addresses on it we were doing great until somebody misplaced the piece of paper and we didn't have any idea what addresses we'd used and where they uh, and what uh, machines they were on so DHCP it says only the iOS when using the iOS DHCP server feature in the DHCP pool mode you need to specify 
this setting using the DNS server command. And this would be for the, the Cisco devices. And what we talked about earlier was using the no IP domain lookup, which turns off the resolution of addresses. So, you know, you kind of get into sometimes you want it, sometimes you don't want it. I don't know the, how many times that you really need a router to be able to do a DNS lookup. Maybe if you're pinging something, or, or typically with them you're using IP addresses, or maybe using the host file that you configured on it. Establishing connectivity between the host and the DNS server. Uh, in a network environment, uh, the router can be configured with the IP address of the DNS server, which would allow the router command attempts to resolve names. Uh, the CLI might issue a ping server 15, and it's ping server 15 to, to me implies that it's a host file, not a DNS. If we don't get a reply, if we can ping the IP address, but not the FQDN, the fully qualified domain name, think DNS as an issue. DNS can resolve it, but we can still get to the resource. We can't get to the DNS server. DHCP configuration. We looked at the DHCP. It's not really all that complicated a protocol. Four-step process, the DORA. Uh, so we have broadcasts, and then we know that when we have broadcasts, we got to worry about routers in between us. Routers will not forward broadcast must be allowed by the routers when the DHCP server is in another broadcast domain. We looked at that. We did a, a configuration of that. The IP helper address configures a DHCP relay agent. So the DHCP relay agent now intercepts the broadcast uh, packets, does a unicast forwarding to the DHCP server. DHCP server, so the discover goes is inter intercepted by the IP helper address. It re relays via unicast to the uh, DHCP server, DHCP server back to the helper. Helper then does the responding as if it were the DHCP server. It does broadcast when there should be broadcast and it does uh, uh, unicast when it should be unicast. And again the broadcast with the door to discover offer a request. The request is a broadcast so that if there are multiple DHCP servers, the other guy knows that you didn't take its IP address and it can put it back into the system. Possible problems, incompatibility uh, between the default configuration of the iOS and the configuration of the relay agent. That's a possibility. It's, it's not a real high probability uh, to have compatibility issues with these things. Use the standard ports, standard operating system, standard procedures for these things. And typically you're going to be using the same age, maybe even the same iOS's on the devices. So is it going to happen? It certainly could. Is it a high probability? Probably not. Faulty NIC. Now that could be, although NICs, NICs used to fail fairly regularly. They don't really fail that often anymore. Uh, the other thing here is this frequent spanning tree. We haven't really talked about spanning tree yet, but frequent spanning tree computations, it is a layer two protocol that prevents us from having layer two loops. And then just, oh, by the way, if we have a layer two loop, we've just brought down our entire network because there's no mechanism to stop broadcast except to break. In layer three, we have the time to live and it'll eventually, it, the, uh, the packet will eventually run out of hops that it can go across and we'll get an error message. It doesn't happen. Layer two. Spanning tree configured here to prevent those. The, uh, the frequent changes is every time that we have a topology change, which means a device goes up or a device goes down, and this is where end devices are going to come in into play, then it goes back, its spanning tree goes back and recomputes its uh, its topology to be sure that it is still a loop free topology so that we don't create broadcast storms and bring the network down uh, or misconfigurations of the DHCP scope. You may run out of addresses. We had an issue on one of our networks that there was something weird and never did get it fully resolved before I left that 
over the weekend when we rebooted the servers and we did something started and took all of the IP addresses out of one of the scopes people come to work and boop, can't get an IP address because all of the uh, all of the devices all the devices all the addresses had been assigned to this whatever it was that was running so misconfiguration of the scope not enough addresses wrong address one of the things that will happen and I tried to make a point when we when we did the relay agent that the uh, that the relay of the discover had to come from the network that the uh, IP address was going to be assigned to you can't get an IP address I mean if you, if you don't have like a 192.168.1 address somewhere you can't or a yeah, interface you can't send a 192.168.1 address to anything if we have a three network I can't send a one address to it for instance so that's one of the uh, of the of the, of the uh, advantages here the uh, the the failure on this is reverse path forwarding when we do that what it does is checks the reverse path to be sure that the request is coming from some place that it expects it to come from different than the expected interface DHCP conflict logging enabled even when the DHCP database agent is not used the database agent will when we do DHCP snooping we will see what it does what this system does is to map the uh, when we do the the uh, DHCP snooping to map the IP address and the uh, interface as well as the MAC address to give us a little bit more assurance that the uh, the correct IP addresses are on these things to troubleshoot DHCP I remember the following guidelines explicitly configure a, a router to act as the DHCP relay agent DHCP clients and servers are on different subnets. Yeah, we did that. We know that we have to uh, to do that kind of configuration. The discover, the the discover and request are both going to be broadcast messages. So if we don't have a relay agent, then we're not going to be able to get the the the, the request packet, the discover packet. We're not going to be able to even start the process. Pool limited number of addresses. When the address limit is reached, the new requests are going to be rejected. Uh, DHCP servers not handing out the same IP address uh, that has been statically assigned. We get a duplicate. You can configure these things to check, and it, essentially what happens when it checks, it pings the IP address that it's about to hand out. If it gets a response, it says, oh, better not use that one. goes on to the next one. Duplicate addresses cause connectivity issues and I think that <clears throat> in Windows that if you have duplicate addresses it's going to shut down both of the NICs until until we can get it resolved so we can configure duplicates and oh by the way if you're using a Windows DHCP server that's not turned on by default you have to go turn it on uh, if, if you wanted to check for duplicates to check to be sure it's not handing out an IP address it's already either assigned or is a static say well why do I have statics we had a long time ago which was actually a boot p device we had a switch which got an ip address boot p was the predecessor the precursor to dhcp didn't have as many components to it and that device just never gave up the address so what we wound up doing was putting that in as as an exception in the DHCP scope so that we gave out addresses around it this was before we had all the sophistication of checking to be sure we're not given out a duplicate address address when you do that so there are there are workarounds for these things but you have to find out what's going on and it took a long time to find out why is this a duplicate what's going on why is this address there more than one DHCP server for redundancy need to ensure that the servers are configured to talk to each other so that they're not giving out the same address. What you probably would do if you're going to configure a duplicate DHCP server is to have the scopes configured so that they're not giving out the same range of addresses. And typically what I've seen in books anyway the proper way to do a backup is if 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 it goes down you have have it on another network with a with a with a relay agent you have your primary DHCP server locally 
uh, with 80% of the addresses and the other DHCP server on another uh, 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 subnet with a relay agent with 20% of the addresses so that you don't get into this, yeah, they've got to talk to each other, some, some more configuration. If you just don't use those addresses, and remember that the clients are going to take the address of, of the first DHCP server that offers it. So we should get some distribution of which servers give out which addresses. And when one runs out of addresses, it just simply won't respond because it doesn't have any addresses to give and the other would then take over the load. So a couple of ways to do that. And this is, you know, they're both got the same scope. Maybe you don't want to configure it that way. Half of the addresses on one and half of the addresses on another one, something like that. Commands related to the uh, troubleshooting, uh, connectivity base, the show IP DHCP conflict, displays the duplicate IP addresses uh, that may have been configured on the network and discovered by a router using the ping command when we do that. Show IP DHCP binding, displays how duplicate addresses were assigned, clear the binding, releases uh, the DHCP lease. Uh, debug IP DHCP server events displays the updates and then debug IP DHCP packet uh, server packet. And then I told you the one that we had all of this this one process that eventually got stopped. We take all of our addresses. We just had to go in and clear the uh, uh, clear the leases. We, we would get the leases back. We take the, the lease from that device. Still had the address, but it wasn't doing anything with the addresses itself. Access control lists, and we've talked about some of the things that can happen to us with ACLs. Uh, the access list has been up, has been applied to the interface. Begin troubleshooting, verify that it's been applied, and it's been applied in the right direction. The other one here that the list is not empty, because if the list is empty, all we have is the implicit deny any. We still have to have at least one permit statement the order of the rules in the access list. And remember, it is an ordered list. The order is significant in it. What happens when? So my thought, and I, what I used to say and will say, is, you know, kind of be the packet. Look at the packet itself and walk it down the access control list. See when one of these statements acts on it. And remember, we, you can do the show access list to see how many times each of the statements has been activated with it. The show IP access list displays the IPv4 lists that are configured, and the show IPv6 access list displays the IPv6s. The show interface, the statistics for all of the interfaces uh, that are configured on the router. So we, a number of show commands, and this goes back, we said early on, Show commands, one of the primary troubleshooting tools is going to be show as well as debug. Debug tells us step by step, we looked at that a little bit with RIP, step by step what the router is actually doing, what it's sending and what it is receiving. Other issues uh, with the standard and the named access list for the routing interfaces, all the packets are getting blocked. What could happen there? The access list is empty. No IP access group or no IPv6 traffic filter command to remove the access list from an interface in order to, to get it off. Uh, if you have an access list, and, and we saw that I think a little earlier when I was doing it with a telnet, it was assigned to the uh, VTY line. It was applied, the access list was applied. I didn't have one. As soon as I wrote that access list, access list one, it then became active on the VTY line. So you can take it off, take it on. If you delete it, it can still be applied. Nothing's gonna happen. When you write it again, it's going to be immediately applied. Another solution is, yeah, obviously turn it off. Don't, don't apply it to the, to the interface. Or you could go in and maybe put a permit statement. Put a permit statement in it. Uh, you can edit it and it will stay active on the interfaces that it's been applied to. A deny filter may be too broad, and this is the order that these things go through. It is an ordered list that allows us to go one step at a time in order to do that. No IP access list command, again, to get that, and no IPv6 access list for the IPv6. Take the access list off 
just do away with the access list as an I filter. Or if it is a, uh, a named list, remember we can edit those relatively easily. Uh, we could go into it and put the permit statement, the, the broad, or move the, uh, uh, the deny filter to the location that it could be, or uh, re modify it in some way to, uh, to make it work with what we want. Deny filter too high in the access list, delete the access list and recreate it. And this delete and recreate it is for really for a numbered list. Named list, we can edit much e more easily. If it's too high in the list, we could move the other statements above it. We can move it down the list in order to, uh, to make this one work without having to delete and rewrite it. If you are using numbered lists, again, put them in Notepad. Put them in Notepad and... Uh, those you have them there, and then you can copy and paste them. The entire thing, access list, whatever access list, and, and the things that we're going to that we're going to do, copy and paste works very nicely in these devices. If you've got the configurations in a in a text editor, one without any formatting information, no existing permit filters, and we've talked about this one. We have to have at least one permit are able to match the package, at least one permit statement in the whole list because if we just do denies then we have a deny at, an, at the end which is the uh, uh, is the implicit deny. Go back up to the top, it's empty. It's kind of tough to get an empty, I guess you could just do a, an access list, but if you do that it tells you, you know, IP access list 1, enter, it's going to tell you that it's an incomplete command. If it's an incomplete command then we're going to have to put something in there. We can put a deny, obviously, and then and then, then we would have a deny, deny. But to get an, an empty access list, you've got to be able to edit it some way to have the access list with no entries in it. And you, you've you seen or maybe saw, I think when I did it, that and I didn't even put the in or the out. It says, oh, it's an incomplete command. You, we're not going to do anything with it. Nothing happens there. More of these no packets are getting blocked. Permit filter too high, uh, may be too high in the access list, may be too broad. And again, it's the same thing, no, no IP access list, delete the list, rewrite the list. And again, I think if it's a name list, you can go in and edit it. Port channel not working with the access control list. Port channel is ether channel. When we do ether channel, we're going to have a number of different things that happen. We use channel group to configure it. We call it ether channel and it is a port channel. The interface that we create is port channel. So a lot of different terms here. When we create this thing we create a virtual interface and we add the physical interfaces to it. When we configure the port channel, finally get to it right, when we configure the port channel, the configurations for the port channel should be inherited by the physical interfaces. That's where all of the action actually takes place in these things. If it's not working right, you've got to look at the physical interfaces to be sure that they are actually inheriting things. And the other one may not have been applied to all of the physical interfaces associated with it. The, use the show port channel database command and again we haven't done those yet we will do ether channel and look at port channels uh, when we get into uh, into into ICND2 we do the configurations there cannot remotely connect to the switch uh, may be an incorrect access control list on the management interface the management interface VLAN 1 the management uh, uh, management VLAN uh, when, when we do those things. So locally uh, connect to the console port, delete the access control list. We, we looked at that Telnet and SSH, you can use access control list on the VTY line or the SSH line depending on which transport protocol you have. No IP access group or no IPv6 uh, traffic filter. So in this case when we, when we Telnet, I use Telnet, I use the VTY line to apply the access control list, which meant I could still do things, uh, other things other than Telnet on the interface. It's on the interface itself. But if you can't get there, 
look at that. Do we have we applied an access control list to the interface that's going to prevent connectivity? Source NAT. Uh, and I had my mistake with NAT. Worked out real well. Did a little troubleshooting. Didn't have the interfaces labeled correctly. So we had to do that. And, and there are a number of steps that are required for NAT. And any of those is going to, can cause an issue with it. So uh, the NAT configuration may be an issue with the configuration of the interface. You saw that. We have to label them as inside and outside because when we give the command, it's IP NAT inside or IP NAT outside. And that tells us which interface that we are NATing, either from inside out or outside in. And typically, you're always just going to do from inside out. Even the one where I did the static, I, I netted from inside out. Uh, it does the same thing, this works in the same direction for those things. NAT won't be able to translate, translate the addresses properly. It won't be able to translate the addresses at all. Uh, an issue with the configuration of the pool, the pool of addresses if we're using the dynamic NAT. Uh, we, we don't have enough addresses, or we, or we haven't given the overload command, overload command down there at the bottom. Uh, are all of the addresses get responses routed back to them. I'm going to say routable. They're going to be routable because they're public addresses, but is there a route to them? Is It can be one of the issues. Configuration issue represents the inside global addresses, the public addresses that we own. Uh, Got to be the correct addresses that need to be translated. Translated. Reaching the public address pool. Yeah, yeah the access control list. Can I get there? Am I being... Uh, allowed to get to do it? Is the access control list written correctly? Is it applied correctly? Do we have the correct access control list in this particular uh, IPNAT statement? So can we get to the public address pool? If it's not reachable or advertised to the internet, the traffic will be unable to return. So two different, yeah, two different things. The one that I had earlier that we have to have a route back to it. The other one is we've got to be able to get to it. So the access control list we have to be on the list of devices that can get NATed addresses. The correct inside devices may not be referenced in the access list yet. Uh, we talked about that. In, ca in, uh, in case the access control list has an incorrect value, uh, the addresses may not be or won't be uh, properly uh, translated. The access control list and the NAT pool are not mapped correctly. When you're doing this, uh, the help screen, the question mark, really helps out a lot. IP NAT, inside, source, whatever the access control list is. And then we can either put in the uh, interface address for PAT or the, uh, the pool uh, for the, the pool of addresses that we're going to translate when we do those things. Overload keyword is missing. Overload says, even if I'm using dynamic NAT, if I run out of addresses, let's go directly into port address translation. Port address translation, single IP address, multiple ports, create sockets. Sockets mean that it's unique, that we can identify uh, the locations that we do need to identify. So the overload keyword, uh, that the configuration is correct. You know, the show command again here, that the packets are not denied from entering the NAT router with an inbound access list. That we're back to a number of things, and there's lots of things that can go wrong, but it, you know, if you're kind of watching what's going on, you probably won't have these things. But an access list is preventing the, the, uh, the, the packets that we want from the devices that we want to enter from being, from getting into the router, into the NAT router. Uh, verify that the NAT router, uh, the appropriate route is defined in the routing table when the packet is going from the inside to the outside. Uh, that all of the necessary, the, uh, that verify that all necessary networks are permitted in the access list. And this goes around and around and around. Yes, the access control list, is it stopping us? Or do we have the permit statements? Do we have the permit statements before the deny statements? Do we have them in the correct order? An access control list are always kind of going to be that way.
access control lists, one of the things to, to, I guess, check as part of the troubleshooting before you apply an access control list, be sure that the whatever you're trying to do works before you apply the ACL because if it didn't work before you put the access list on, it's not going to work after you put it on. Some people apply and say, well, maybe this will fix it. Probably not going to fix it. Uh, all of them are permitted. Ensure that sufficient addresses are available in the NAT pool. And if they're not, we can go into PAT with the overload command, even with the dynamic NAT. The reason we would get it overload, if we did run out of addresses, then we would go into the port address translation, and I think that it would go back and use the IP address of the interface. That's what PAT uses, is whatever the, uh, the, the uh, IP address of, of the interface that we're going out of, uh, that we're NATing from uh, those two. Verify the appropriate de de definitions again on the NAT inside, the NAT outside, on the interfaces themselves, that we have them properly marked. Uh, allow us to resolve connectivity issues, uh, however you need to be aware of the potential issues of NAT, modifies the checksum. NAT, NAT breaks actually some security protocols, some VPN protocols break NAT because the security protocol sees it as a man in the middle attack, which it basically is, and stops it. Uh, most of these VPNs have a, uh, have a, a pass-through capability for NAT to allow it, the configurations not. It, I think that a lot of these, a lot of these problems go back to some older uh, hardware where we would have issues with that. But most of the NAT devices that we use in the Cisco world anyway, the end device is going to be a firewall. Firewall is where we're going to have the VPN. Hopefully the VPN is going to know about the NAT process, but you may have an issue. I had somebody tell me one time, oh yeah, I had that problem. I was trying to get through, and actually it was a VPN trying to get through, and it would NAT at the other end, get through a wireless firewall while he was traveling. And it's a matter, was a matter of configuring the VPN pass-through. So VPNs, uh, these things are possible that the packet whose checksum has been modified by NET will be rejected by the VPN protocol. IPsec because the packet might appear to be have been altered. Might look like it's, a, it's the victim of a man-in-the-middle attack. Will hide the true IP address information. That was what made it our security protocol when we talked about NET. It is a security mechanism. The true IP address is going to be, obviously, the private IP address. What it hides doesn't have to be, but it typically is going to be. Uh, but what it hides is our internal uh, structure, what we look like inside of our private network. Use the show IP NAT translations. We did that when we looked at the NAT demo. And it just has the, uh, the, the, the inside local and the inside global addresses, what goes where, and the port number. So we had sockets with those also. Some applications are not compatible with NAT. Being, you see, this is because when they are initialized, some applications will randomly determine ports are to be used for communication. One of those would be FTP. Uh, we have to be in FTP. We need to be in FTP passive mode, not necessarily for NAT, but more for the firewall configuration. And what passive mode does is when it, the FTP uses two ports. It uses one to do the connection, 20 and 21, to do, 21 to do the connection. That's why we say FTP 21. And then 20 is used to do the data transfer. What it actually does is creates a port someplace else and the the passive mode sends that port out so that you know where to connect back to it on when we do those things. NAT modifies the layer 3 information in the packets uh, so additional delays yeah a little bit although the additional delays we talk about are, are not anything that I don't think we're going to notice a whole lot about when we do those things. The numerous NAT there may be a delay, may be more evident, and numerous delays I think would be in the thousands of these of the uh, of the NAT uh, packets. The 
Shopa IP NAT translations we looked at displays the statically and dynamically configured NAT translations. The clear IP NAT translations, and you do have to use the asterisk, allows to clear all of the dynamic entries. You can't just use the clear command. And you'll get an error message that says that you have to use the asterisk. And it's just one of those like, okay, if you tell me what I need to do, why didn't you just clear it for me? But it doesn't do that. Show the NAT statistics. Uh, displays the interfaces that are acting as the inside and the outside interfaces, the number of static and dynamic translations, and then debug IP NAT, uh, the actual NAT translations that take place on these things. Uh, when we do, and then debug is like every other debug, it, it, what's going on on the system itself, what's going in and what's coming, what going in and coming out, what is the router doing with these things. NTP issues the time protocol issues uh, that we would have. Uh, NTP is another one of those not real complex protocols. What was it? it was uh, NTP server and then the IP address, where we're going to get the information. And then we could have the NTP master, we're going to send it. So NTP, and we could use an FQDN or the IP address. Doesn't have to be on our network as long as we can get there. I think one of the keys there is, is ping it. But the client is not able to synchronize it, ping to test connectivity, access control list again. Do we have an access control list that's stopping us from getting to the NTP server? Is it within our network? Or we have the configuration correctly in the, uh, in the device itself that we want to do these things with? This is where some of the centralized management that we'll talk about uh, configuration issues or configure centralized configuration where everybody gets the same configuration comes in handy because we don't have the issue of of uh, having something misconfigured on one and properly configured on another one because we made the typo. No access control list, all of those things. Use the show run and the, and the pipe command here, section NTP. This is something that I hadn't talked about because it does not work well in Packet Tracer, but instead of using showing the entire uh, run configuration or the entire startup configuration file, you can look at different elements uh, of it with the pipe command. And, and there are, are uh, filters that will allow you to show the different elements, in this case, the section NTP to verify the authentication configuration and verify that the server and the client are configured with the correct authentication keys. We're just going to look at it. We could use just the show run to see everything, or we don't want to go through the whole thing and hit the paste bar, continue, continue, continue. If it's a long configuration, you can draw out the, the different elements, the different parts of what goes on with it. Uh, the keys, the, the NTP, you see the authentication is configured correctly. Uh, show NTP status uh, that the server is being, that, yeah, to verify the NTP server is being used. And then uh, show processes. Oh, yeah, I was going to go back to the uh, debug. You could debug NTP and you could see if the authentication was uh, properly set up, that it was, that you were, you had the right keys, that you were actually trying to do authentication if, uh, or that the other end is actually sending you authentication information. Have we overloaded, use the show process as CPU, that the CPU is not overloaded. NTP is probably not going to do that, but other ones can. Show clock uh, to verify that the, uh, that the clock, that is the clock set on the device, the clock's running. And again, one of the things that we talked about in this, if they're too far out of time, they're not going to synchronize. So you, you may want to set the clock fairly close to what the uh, NTP server is and then allow the, uh, the master to bring it into, uh, into, into the correct time. The issue with NTP is not that we have, everybody has the correct time. It's that everybody has the same time so that if something happens, we can look at the effect of one on the other of the, of the devices that we have. So we have these DHCP lab, and then we have a number of labs. So the next set of issues are interface and cable issues. Interface NIC, down at the bottom, auto negotiation and NIC card issues. One time, 
once upon a time, I guess now, years ago, many years ago now, Cisco actually had a problem with auto negotiate. All of the devices today and all the interfaces on the uh, switches that we're connecting to are set for auto negotiate, which automatically negotiates speed and duplex. If there is a problem, you may, you may need to go in and manually configure them. If you do, you got to be sure they're correct on both sides. I've got, and we're going to talk about some of the other things, but the things that can happen to you in red here obviously is bad. With a cable mismatch here, a straight through cable, straight through from a switch to a switch, straight through cables like to like is wrong. Crossovers go like to like, same type of equipment. Switch to switch, nick to nick, hub to hub, switch to hub. Those things should all be crossover cables. The like here, you see that we don't get any communication. The reason is the transmit is going to the transmit without a crossover and the receive is going to the receive, so it's not going anywhere. Now that's without the auto MDI, MDIX. And MDI, I looked it up, stands for Medium Dependent Interface. So the Medium Dependent Interface says that we've got to have a crossover cable when a crossover cable is required. The auto there, the second one down here, uh, automatically determines what kind of a cable is required and modifies the port. Probably like what your uh, uh, switch at home on your on your wireless router does. It It will automatically configure the port to the kind of cable that it needs. If you plug in a straight through and it needs a crossover, it swaps the receive and the transmit so that the transmit goes to the receive and the receive to the transmit at the other end. The next one down here, same thing happens with a hub. Uh, the straight through and the crossover. We need to do those. And the old hubs that we had actually had a, a physical switch on them that you could continue to use a straight through cable, but you had to set it into into the crossover mode on the uh, on the port itself. The one at the bottom, the duplex mismatch and the speed mismatch, just ain't going to work. And I think later on when we say that, it says it may cause some issues. And and when we ha and we did some manual configurations during this time that Cisco said that you may have a problem. And then and it goes bad. And we put in a new NIC. And the default is auto negotiate. And we have a manual speed and duplex set on the switch. And plug this device in and it doesn't work. So if I got a bad NIC, no, I don't have a bad NIC. I had a configuration issue because one end was auto negotiate and the other end was set for static speed and duplex. So the kinds of things that can happen to you with the mismatches, the cable, uh, the speed duplex mismatches, all of those. Auto negotiate is the default. Auto negotiate is going to work most of the time. 99.9% .9 of the time shouldn't have an issue with it. Batter damage cable, physical damage. One of the things that happens to us with uh, copper with the RJ45s is that you plug them in and unplug them so many times that the tab breaks off. The tab and then the, the, the connector backs out a little bit. We have issues. Or people don't get them all the way in when we do that. Uh, the, so we can have that damage yeah, they get damaged. The radiusing of the fiber can cause an issue. If, if you bend any of this stuff too sharply, you can cause issues with it, including copper. Uh, it, they're not automatically totally uh, resistant to any of these things. You need to ensure that you have the correct cable type for the connections. For Ethernet, you, you need to use, and you're not going to see Cat 3, and you guys may not even see a lot of Cat 5, which was a, a gigabit capability. Uh, Cat 3 copper cable, 10 megabits per second. Uh, not sure they even make it anymore. One of the things that you do need to be sure of that it is plenum cable. Plenum cable is one that the outer coating doesn't burn with a poisonous gas. PVC, uh, polyvinyl chloride, I think, and the last word there is significant chloride. Whenever it burns, you can get a, a, a gas that you don't want. Plenum cable is approved to be run through airspaces. A lot of times that uh, the overheads and the false overheads is used for the return air, and that's where we put a lot of our cabling in. So uh, PVC, or not PVC, uh, 
plenum cable and it'll be marked on it as plenum. Uh, need to use Cat 5, 5E, or 6 for the 10100, 10100, 1000 connections. And the, the 10, all of that represents that it's got, it's backward, backward, cap, backwardly capable of those feeds. Not that we would want to run at 10 megabits per second. Not that we would want to put anything on our network that ran at 10 megabits per second. But if you do, the switch will automatically negotiate 10 megabits per second. Full or half duplex, depending on what the uh, device is itself. Are they shielded? They could be. It depends on whether you buy shielded or unshielded. All the ones that we had were unshielded. And the question was, are plenum cables shielded? They can be. It just it depends on what you buy. The shield or the plenum itself is just the, the outer casing of it, the outer covering of it. Uh, to, uh, uh, so that if, if you have, yeah, and expensive. Uh, although I'm not sure that you can get anything other than plenum anymore. I haven't, I haven't done any looking at bulk for a long time. We used to make our own cables, which actually we had students make our own cables, which sometimes worked out and sometimes didn't work out. So I'm very familiar with the uh, uh, physical <laughs> physical problems with cables not made right, the, the get them crossed or, or not not crossed or make one end wrong from the other end, don't get them all the way in, all the wires don't work. Uh, cable testers are a good thing to have with that. So the plenum could be or could not be uh, shielded depending on what, what you bought. And the, while the category here is a lot of it dictates the number of twists per foot uh, and then what kind of shielding goes on, when you get to CAT 7 it's got to have the shielding in order to get the speeds that it needs. Uh, to do that. And the more twists, the, the, the more expensive they are because the shorter or the more copper is going to be in the same distance because, but you're going to have a whole lot better noise rejection from the, uh, from the number of twists. And that's one of the, the big things, the shielding as well as the number of twists per foot in the twisted, is in the twisted pair that takes us from one category, one speed to the other. Uh, fiber, verify the, the correct cable. For the distance and port type, multi-mode or single-mode fiber, what are we using? Then we have the correct connectors, and, and the we'll look at, and the next time we'll look at uh, media a little bit more. I know you look at media in, uh, in a, a Network Plus, uh, but what are we going to use? And the, the connector obviously has to match up with the, uh, the device that it's connecting to, unlike RJ45. Uh, fiber doesn't have all of the standardization I think that we have here so which which ones are we going <clears throat> which ones are we going to use copper crossover cable uh, was used when a straight through was required or vice versa we have problems with that was that's what I tried to show in that little in that little demo uh, you may need to enable auto MDI MDIX on the switch or replace the cable the auto MDI MDIX automatically detects uh, what kind of again what kind it is and that it will then modify the port duplex and speed mismatch we have issues with those and we really don't have any kind of connectivity the duplex the half duplex and the full duplex uh, the half duplex is all based on timing when you when you expect to send and when you expect to receive full duplex doesn't care it can transmit and receive at the same time so we would have issues there. The speed mismatch is again a timing issue, what's going to happen with these things. Uh, duplex settings don't match between the switches. Uh, manual hard coding we go in and set them manually to those things. Uh, with CDB enabled you will see a C. And this is where this morning we talked about collisions. This is where the CDP might show up. I told you it was it was really kind of a, a remote or, or obscure a place when mismatch occurs between two Cisco devices with CDP enabled, which would be default, you will see CDP error messages on the console or in the logging buffer of both devices. Useful in detecting errors as well as port and system statistics in nearby Cisco devices. The well known, and this is one of those that you know you might kind of want to look at 01000C, and that's Cisco starts with that, and then CCCCCC is the well known MAC address for CDP. And I guess it's handy that it CDP's well-known MAC address starts with C's or is C's. Duplex mismatch. 
cause late collisions uh, among the most common reasons. And again, there's no reason to have these things because all of the devices are auto uh, detect. When we plug them in, they're going to automatically detect and auto detect works. I'm going to automatically uh, detect the speed and the duplex and correctly configure the other end. I always need to set both sides for auto negotiate. If one set for a static and one set for an auto negotiate, it's still going to be a problem. It's still going to be an error even though you may communicate. It may actually uh, do the negotiation correctly. And actually, most of the ones, I've tried I've tried this just to see what happens, and, and most of the time it, it, it says, okay, we got it, full duplex gigabit or full duplex whatever, whatever is set up for it. Uh, auto speed and duplex to one side, and the other side is a misconfiguration and may result in a duplex mismatch. It won't necessarily. Uh, let's see, the error disable can result in a port being placed in the error disable status and we saw what happened with that with port security. It's not really shut down, it just doesn't send anything. The half duplex side of the duplex mismatch only expects packets at certain times. If it receives a packet at any other times, we consider it as a packet collision and that's because the full duplex doesn't care about that it only has certain times that it can get. Uh, data. It can get data at any time because it's full duplex. It can go both directions. Transmit and receive at the same time. Collisions, we know that that is when two stations trying to use the same piece of media, just like a collision on a highway, two cars trying to use the same one lane bridge at the same time are going to have a collision. Transmit data simultaneously without being aware of the other one. Uh, occurs when the two nodes are listened to the traffic hear none or detect no other traffic and that's one of the reasons that uh, cable that is the improper length can can help cause or help uh, stimulate or call more have a higher probability I guess is what I'm trying to get to of of collisions because they they the the one system expects that it's data would be off of the cable if it was the correct length and the other one doesn't see it until it's too late when we do those things. Show interface, ethernet command, view the number of collisions that have occurred, and you really shouldn't see any of these in a full duplex. If you start seeing collisions in a full duplex, then we've got some other issues going on on the network. Uh, normally on interface configured as half duplex because we have to use the CSMA CD in the half duplex. We don't do that in the, uh, in the full duplex. Late collision, had that question this morning. Uh, two devices transmit the same time, neither side, uh, and neither side of the connection detects a collision occur because uh, the time to propagate the signal from one end of the network to another is longer than the time to put the entire packet on the network. That means, I try to do, and I, you, you probably got this, but I just can't not try to do this one if I can get a pin going here. So we have our network here and we'll just have a, a bus. So we have a system here and a system down here maybe. And what it says is that this should be the length of time to propagate it, but the network is that much longer because the time to propagate the signal from one end of the network to the other is longer than the, the time to put the entire packet on the network. So the entire packet's on the network. We got extra space here. This guy doesn't see anything. Puts his data on the network and we're going to have a collision when those things happen. And the speed is each, each copper device has a different uh, a different rate, different speed, different different lengths when we do those. Let's see, excessive collisions. Uh, collisions uh, counter increases after 16. Late collisions, and, and it occurs after 16 attempts have been made to send the packet, it's going to be dropped, and the counter is going to be incremented. So this is when we start getting the collision counter in the, in the show interfaces. And again, on the switch, we really don't expect to see collisions on the, on the switch. Uh, counter increments is an indication of a wiring problem. Excessively loaded networks 
duplex mismatch. Duplex mismatch, probably the more logical one. Uh, loaded network, yeah, it could be, but we're still full duplex on most of these things. Cable errors, the type of errors, input Q drops too much. It's either information is received information faster than it could process. We're sending information faster than the destination can receive it. Output Q drops, uh, congestion's not able to send the information. Input errors, the frames were not received correctly, and the output errors, they weren't transmitted correctly. Uh, duplex mismatch on both the input and the output errors, the CRC errors, or cyclical redundancy checks for these things. Troubleshoot speed and duplex issues. Uh, look at both ends of the link, and you know, be sure that they're set for the same speed and duplex. Show run if it uh, if it's manually configured. If it's auto detect, we're going to see some of the the, the uh, collision problems, uh, timing problems, not really getting the speed that we think we should have problems. In that case, how would you troubleshoot it is to, to uh, manually set it and see if it fixes the problem. Mismatch and speed show the uh, interface status as not connected or inactive, which is what the little demo showed. Mismatch and duplex will, will show problems and will not be able to communicate properly with the endpoint. The full duplex uh, will appear, says that the interfaces will appear active Mine didn't appear active. I tried that a couple of times. Will appear active, but you're not going to be getting the uh, throughput that you should be getting on these things. Other issues, excessive noise. Uh, and, and lots of things can cause noise on our network. The solutions over here check uh, for damages to any of the cables, signal reflections due to badly spaced taps, Badly spaced taps. That is that goes way back to uh, to uh, ten base five. The frozen uh, water hose, big five hundred mega five hundred meter uh, Ethernet, which you actually use taps. You tap into the cable itself, and if you get the way the the way that uh, signal propagation works. If you have them at the wrong spacing, you could actually have the cable itself act as a deterrent to it, either to reduce the signal, and that's just, that's just the way way propagation works, uh, without going into it, because I don't remember. I remember some of it, but not all of it, but badly spaced is they're too close together, usually too close together, and there was always a minimum length that you needed to have, and I think it's something like, I don't know, three feet, uh, maybe not that, but there's a minimum length that you need for the cable, otherwise it becomes a, uh, a, a, a an inf it, the signal looks at an infinity at the other end of the cable, which means that the signal is going to be stopped when we do those things. So when we look at the output show interfaces, we're going to have CRC errors, uh, but the lesser number of collisions, which is an indicator of excessive noise on the interface, and on the right there, ensure that the, uh, the that we're using. Uh, it says here using only Cat5 cabling and not any other type, unlike uh, Cat3. So Cat5, 6, 7, the the higher level cables, and and Mike says they're expensive. Yeah, the the long the farther we go, the higher the speed, the more expensive the cable. The cable itself. Uh, the copper cable and the uh, and the fiber cable are coming closer and closer to pricing cl pricing closeness for the cable, but the connectors are still pretty much uh, a, a, dis a difference because I, uh, RJ45 probably about seventy five cents, and I think five to ten depending on which one five to ten dollars maybe for a uh, fiber. And you guys that that have worked with fiber maybe if if that's if that's not relatively correct. Put something in the chat what goes on with these things. Excessive collisions, show interfaces Ethernet again. Use a TDR, a time domain reflectometer. A time domain reflectometer sends a signal, and we have a, an optical time domain reflectometer also, sends a signal down a piece of wire and measures faults in the wire, tells you 
in feet, meters, inches, whatever it's set up to do, how far down the cable this is. I had my first experience with this working on A4s. When the engine guys would change the engine, overhaul an engine in an A4, you took the airplane apart in the middle. Well, all of the AT stuff went right through there. Sometimes they didn't get it back together right. We used a TDR to troubleshoot where to find out where our cable problems were. They're not an inexpensive device, but they do work very, very well. And there, again, there's also one for an optical time domain reflectometer. Maybe that the patch is bad. Maybe the connector is bad. Uh, different, different things like that. Uh, when we, when we uh, look at the cable itself. Uh, any transceiver attached to a host that is constantly sending unwanted signals. And that's where the, you may see the, the LEDs, and some of them have them, some of them don't anymore. The LEDs on the back of the, uh, of the NIC or on the switch itself, if it looks like it's flashing too much and flashing when there's nothing actually going on, we may have an issue of, of the uh, unwanted bad NIC, bad signal. Bad necks, again, those things don't occur like they used to. But excessive collisions show the interface is Ethernet. Excessive runt frames, runts are the ones that are too small, uh, occur in a shared Ethernet environment, but the collision rate's not high enough. Or they occur in a switched environment when they may be due to uh, underruns or bad software on the NIC. Protocol analyzer to try to determine where they are. Protocol analyzer a wire shark, a sniffer of some sort, to try to figure out the source of these things so that you can go find the bad nick. Late collisions, here we are again, the cables are too long. Too many repeaters are used in a network. In the true Ethernet world, where we had 10 base 2 and 10 base 5, 100 meters, we had repeaters. And what we could have in these cables, we had this thing called a 543 rule. We said we could have five segments of 100 meters each. That gives us 500 meters. Separated by four repeaters. Repeater again renews the signal. Three of those may be populated. So cables used were too long, or when there are too many repeaters used in the network, we go beyond the 500 meter repeated limit when we do those things. And on the right there, the solution check for late collisions by using a protocol analyzer. The diameter of the network, the diameter of the network is how long it is uh, when we do those things. No link integrity on 10 base, 100 base, T4, 100 base, TX, wrong wire type may be used. Mismatch in the card, cross connect cable, excessive noise may cause the issues. A whole bunch of things over there you're using. Uh, uh, not using 100 base T4 when only two pairs of the wire are available because T4 requires uh, four pairs. Uh, when we changed standards, probably 6A, we went from using four wires to, uh, to eight wires, so four pair. Uh, check for a mismatch in the 10 base T, 100 base T4, 100 base TX to do these things. T, of course, is twisted pair of the identity. Whether it's a cross connect cable, one and three for a cross connect, pins one and three, two and six are crossed. And you can look at the ends if they're the same. Orange and white, orange, green, white, blue, blue and white, uh, blue, blue and white, green, yeah, brown and white, brown. Uh, the EITA 64B. And after you do that enough, you'll, those, are kind of the things that stick with you. Compare the two ends and you can see if it, you can physically look at the colors and see if it's a crossover or not. VLANs. And we've looked at some of those incorrect, and I tried to show some of those when we started VLANs. Incorrect IP addressing, the frames won't flow as expected when either the IP address of the subnet mask or the default gate was not configured. And that's true of anything. The IP config command to see that. Missing VLANs are configured and go missing when they're not configured on the switch or accidentally deleted. Remember, we saw that. I did the accidental deletion or the, the intentional accidental deletion. The ports go away. When we recreated the VLAN, the ports came back. So you need to, this is would all be part of uh, documentation when we go there. 
uh, VTP, VLAN trunking protocol, another one that we get introduced here will actually do the configuration. It sends all of the configuration information. The VLAN, we create a VLAN on one switch. It sends it to all the other switches and creates the VLAN. Doesn't put any ports on the VLAN, but it creates it for us. Uh, VTP not propagating, and the big reason it wouldn't propagate is we didn't have a uh, trunk port uh, between, the, between the switches or around the switches. Uh, missing VLAN could be that you're using VTP1 or 2 on a switch that has a higher revision number. Configuration revision number, the one that has the highest is the one that all the switches are going to listen to. So if we, for instance, put a switch into the system that high had a configuration revision number higher than what we were doing on our network or had a different set of VLANs, that's the one that's going to be believed, and it's going to wipe out our configuration. Again, this is one that we'll look at in uh, in, in the uh, next week in, in ICND2. We'll we'll look at look at the configuration revision number, talk about VLAN trunking protocol, configure VLAN trunking protocol. Incorrect port assignments, and you've seen that that's relatively easy to do. That's why I go into the yeah, what port are they on that we want the VLAN number associated with the uh, maybe the, the uh, uh, network address and then when we get into the sub interfaces make the sub interface the same as the uh, as the uh, uh, network address the same as the VLAN number so that when you start configuring these things or troubleshooting them it's easy to look at them and say yeah that one's right because this is the standard that I used in order to create these things. Switchboard's got to be assigned to the VLAN uh, after taking into account the devices that will be connected to the port. So we have to assign those static assignment, switch port, access, VLAN, whatever, after we create those things. Enter switch connectivity, switch to switch connectivity. We know that the ports by default are set to auto negotiate. And the auto negotiate that they're set to is dynamic auto, which means that if I plug two switches together with a crossover cable, they're not going to create a trunk. And then all of that other stuff, VTP is not going to happen. All of the other things, our, our VLANs are not going to be able to propagate from one to the other using switch tagging because I don't have a trunk port. To get a trunk port, we either need to set one side as dynamic desirable or just use a switch port mode trunk command to do that. If we use a switch port mode trunk, tells the auto, hey, I want to be a trunk and let's do it right now. So they turn it turns into a trunk. The desirable desires to be a trunk. The dynamic auto is kind of easily influenced. Somebody says, I would like to do this. It says, oh, okay, I'll be a trunk because you asked me to be a trunk. Uh, limited connectivity, result of one side being operationally a trunk and the other side operationally an access port. Limited connectivity. Usually when we see that, we're going to see that the limited is, is limited to somewhere around none. Uh, connectivity only occur when the access port VLAN on one switch happens to be on the same native VLAN for the 802.1Q uh, trunk. Connectivity will occur only when the access port VLAN. Native VLAN is for untagged frames, and we'll get into the native VLAN configuration and set up, I'll set up a couple of them, or, or do a, a native VLAN mismatch and see what happens with those things. What can actually happen is you can get sent from one VLAN to the other. The native VLAN untagged, let's say that on one side the native VLAN is 2 and on the other side the native VLAN is 8. We put a frame on the on the trunk port from VLAN 2, native VLAN, untagged, goes to the other end, gets there and says, oh, this one doesn't have a tag on it. It goes to the native VLAN, which is 8. So you can go from maybe the students to the uh, uh, payroll VLAN or from the uh, production to the payroll VLAN. Everybody wants to get on the payroll VLAN, but you have to be careful about those, the native VLAN. Untagged frames. VLAN numbers match the frames successfully forwarded without a problem. I've seen different things happen on this on the native VLAN, depending on what I configure, and this is all in demo mode, basically, but sometimes it just doesn't, won't send the stuff. In any case, it's going to send you a whole bunch of error messages with a uh, native VLAN mismatch. You may or may not have 
uh, limited connectivity on them. A VTP, VLAN trunking protocol domain mismatch. And again, we have troubleshooting on things that we haven't really talked about yet. But when we create the VTP domain, the VLAN trunking protocol domain, again, part of ICND2, we have to give it a domain. When we give it a domain and all the trunk ports are there, it automatically tells all the other switches to join this domain. If we have another one that is in a different domain, they're not going to share information. The VTP, what the advantage of it is we can create a VLAN on one switch, and if we have 100 switches in our network, it'll be, the VLAN will be created on 100 switches. We don't have to go in and manually configure them. Native VLAN mismatch, uh, that the native VLAN matches on both sides of the link. Uh, it, it's possible to leak from one VLAN to the other. That's what I've been, we talked about that. Uh, the, the two and the eight going from one to the other. Previously defined route is missing. Uh, with this one, the defined route is missing. You need to consider following. If it's a dynamic routing protocol, maybe an interface went down. Maybe a network actually went down and it's not being advertised anymore. Uh, can ping, let's see, in this one, the end to end connectivity becomes a problem. You need to ensure that you can ping your own interface and other devices on the directly connected network. The troubleshooting we did ping the loopback, ping your own IP address, ping something else on your network, usually the default gateway for the devices that we use. And after we verify the connectivity, begin testing the connectivity to the remote devices. Is routing actually happening? And it could be that that network, that device, that area doesn't exist anymore. So that route may have come out improperly. Could be a, a bad interface. Could be an interface failed on the other end. And include a failure of an interface uh, that may cause these things. Troubleshooting, and we did these. You had a couple of labs on this. Ping trace route, show IP route, show IP interface brief. You've seen those several times. Show CDP neighbors details, show CDP neighbors different commands. Uh, for troubleshooting, the devices that we have will do with these things. RIP v2 for IPv4, missing RIP v2 routes. If that happens, one thing to be sure is that. We've got the same, we've got RIP v2 on all of the devices. I set one up, I had a RIP v2, and I forgot I had a RIP v2 network. And I just put in RIP v1, and I didn't get the net, I didn't get the routes. I got, I got to say, the RIP v1 didn't get any routes because it couldn't read the RIP v2 uh, packet. The RIP v2 could have got the updates from the v1, but Things that can happen may not be enabled. The interface needs to be in the up-up mode. The first up physical, the second up that we have the same layer 2 encapsulation protocol at both ends. We have to have that. Sender may be in a subnet different than the subnet of the receiver of the updates. Uh, the updates will be ignored. The, we have to be able to communicate with our devices they they have to be the the two devices are directly connected have to be on the same ip subnet be able to ping each other typically for those we can use a 252 mask where we only have the take a, take the four addresses instead of a an entire uh, private network address and when you think about it though do you really need to do that and this is just a uh, not a test question but a you know a kind of a practical question in IPv4, we have all these private addresses. The addresses that connect the two routers together don't actually have to be routable IP addresses because they're just connecting them together to do that. One hop to the next because that's all, that's all you do is one to the other. When we do a, a route to a routable network, it tells us which address nick to go out of or where the next hop is and then that one knows where the next hop is and on down the line those addresses aren't routable the public addresses that we're trying to get to are routable just something to think about when you do those things so we have all these class c networks do we really need to do all of this subnetting not that so you don't need to know about it because you do need to know about it there are times when you want bigger networks or smaller networks and you want to use the same addressing scheme. You want to be able to have smaller uh, uh, IP route tables. 
And to do that, we need we can do the uh, the aggregation, putting the things together logically, so that we can send a whole bunch of information. The 10.60.10 stuff, 10.60. 20, 10.60.30, we send all of those to the 10.60. So a logical uh, assignment of IP addresses allows us to put fewer entries into our route table. Router has to work less to do that. Sender of the RIP update, yeah, we may be on a different subnet. Uh, the network statement enables the RIP process on the interface is either bad or missing. When we did the RIP, RIP router RIP, and then we assigned the networks that we wanted to advertise, I said, you also have to enable the network on the interface that goes out of it. That, that's kind of a, a backward way of saying that. But the interface that connects to the other devices has to be included in that network statement. That activates the protocol on that interface and allows it to participate in the RIP or the EIGRP or the OSPF, any of the dynamic routing protocol, uh, routing protocol uh, systems. I, I don't want to say autonomous system because when we get into uh, EIGRP it uses that term, but in our network uh, we'll say. Maybe a passive interface. Pa passive interfaces don't play. Uh, the router uh, sender RIP updates a different RIP version. The maximum hop count is exceeded. Hop count 15 is the maximum, 16 becomes infinity. And how can we get those hop counts? We could have too many routers or if we're doing a redistribution of one protocol into another one, we have to have a, a, a seed metric in order to start these things out. The seed metric may be set wrong that it goes too far uh, before we, but, you know, that we set the, the seed metric too high and, and it runs out of hops before we get to, to where we want to go. Additional reasons, authentication parameters aren't matching. Route filters, access control lists again, split horizon. Uh, is applied because of which router will be able to use the same interface. Again, if we have, uh, and this would be, you know, some place where we could use sub interfaces that uh, we would be able to uh, use the same physical interface. The split horizon can't send out what it came in on is for the physical interface, not the sub interfaces. And I'll go back a little bit to the question Mike asked yesterday. Can you use it for DHCP? And I thought about that, and you can kind of, sort of. If you put your DHCP server on one of those uh, uh, VLANs, and it would go into the, uh, uh, the the router on a stick, and and it would take care of the broadcasting that goes from one to the other because we're not going across a router. I, I think that would work if you if you wanted to uh, to use one of the, you know, a sub interface, a sub interface ID. You're still we're still using IP addresses, IP networks to do these things. It's just a matter of how we get the traffic from one to the other. So back to the summarize, it does auto auto summarization. RIP V1 does auto summarization because it's a classful network. Summarizes the this if we have subnetted it summarizes the class less networks at class full boundaries could result in problem and, and discontiguous networks is if we subnetted subnetted a network and we we had two routers here we subnetted and we had one subnet over here and one subnet over here. So each of these guys, when they summarize a classful boundaries, thinks they have the entire IP network, the, the entire classful network, summarized network, and they don't. So we won't, might not be able to get from one end to the other. So th that's what this, uh, when we talk about discontiguous networks are, that they're separated in that way. Let's see, when exactly the same network is learned from a more reliable source, determined by administrative distance. Uh, we can do that, the administrative distance, that means that we've got two different routing protocols on the device. The one with the lower administrative distance is the one that's always going to win in these things. Access control list, again, denying RIP packets. Equal path metrics for certain routes will be missing from the routing table. Maximum pass value is set for incorrectly. The default was four. We can 
we can manage that and I think that the maximum is eight per rip but what if it set it two and we expected to have four different uh, different ones uh, hop count exceeded maximum hop count is 15 and unreachable 16 maybe we got more than than more routers than that 15 or more physical routers and the other one down there when we redistribute routes into rip we have to set a seed metric in order to uh, have a starting point for the uh, for the hop count if we set that value too high it, then it can go there and I don't know why you would set it for anything other than like one or two but you might do that commands to uh, to verify and there are going to be a number of tables here that will go through verify the rip database show IP rip verify the status show IP interface brief we've seen that and that's where we want to see the up up identify and correct an incorrect subnet debug IP rip uh, to see what's going on there verify the network statement show IP protocols show IP protocols will tell you which protocols are running and which networks they are routing for that they're advertising and, it, and it's it's one that that we would uh, look at show run pipe to section router rip to come to verify and again this is we don't want to look at the whole the whole uh, uh, configuration running configuration command we can use that passive interfaces and the show IP protocols will sh tell you which are passive interfaces and we can see if they're playing in it the rip version debug IP rip and I think in the show IP protocols yeah the show IP protocols will also tell you which version you're running you got to have be running the same version the debug when we looked at it the version number was in the uh, in the packet that came in to us applied offset list this is something that is beyond again what we're going to do here uh, the show protocols access list the show IP route debug IP route uh, command to verify that the rip update is not installed on the routing table the debug IP rip to verify that the rip metric for a specific route uh, show IP route and then the command to verify the first access list on the router uh, command to check whether the offset list has been applied but these other commands down here we're going to look at the offset list yeah, we're not we're not going to get into into those authentication uh, show keychain show protocols show uh, run interface whatever and I think debug will show what's coming in and what's going out on the uh, you know on the on the traffic itself or the authentication are we using uh, keys that are author that we have used when, when we do those things the route filter entries in a prefix list in the rip distributed list the IP protocols IP prefix list uh, verify the advertised routes and the split horizon is enabled if we have an issue split horizon may be causing the issue because we can't go we can't send it out the interface that it came in on the status of the automatic summarization feature debug IP rip show IP protocols and if we want to turn it off no auto summary is all that we have to use in the uh, in the router in the router rip command the auto summary and no auto summary it's on by default we can turn it off the sources of the information used by the router to learn the routes show IP rip database show IP route rip debug IP rip different things and we keep coming back to the same commands time after time after time verify the routers applied access list show access list we can see the statements that are in there the lists that are available show IP interface include access list command to see where they're actually applied because we know that it's a two-step process we write the access control list and then we apply to the interface inbound or outbound maximum number of paths that are configured for load balancing show IP protocols uh, the number of paths that are actually there and again that is a configurable number so we're now down to the next set of labs which is relatively short Let's go ahead and finish this up. The thing that we talked about this morning, port security, port security violation. What could cause a violation? You know, a hostile attack, uh, viruses, uh, accidental reconfiguration, or the student that comes in and plugs in their laptop where they shouldn't be, or the 
faculty that plugs in their laptop where they shouldn't be, or the boss that plugs in his uh, wireless access point or his wireless router where it shouldn't be and puts too many devices on the network. The number of, of MAC addresses uh, per port is determined and the interface must be configured with the same number of addresses. How many are we going to have? If we go over that, as we saw, it goes into error disable mode. What can cause those too many there? All of the, all of the things that are listed there, the virus, uh, uh, somebody using a Mac off or something, trying to turn our switch into a hub so that they can, to, so that they can uh, watch all the traffic. Uh, some sort of an attack may be in process. To resolve the security violations, the, the CPU is not overloaded. Uh, to set the violation mode to shut down so if we have an issue, it doesn't keep going, uh, doesn't keep trying to do things, puts it into error disable mode, which effectively says, don't send anything anymore. Uh, port security configuration. Uh, port can be configured with a static or a sticky secure address. If you change the set of allowed VLANs on the trunk, the configured addresses located in certain VLANs may be erased by the software. And again, we can configure this thing. One of, the, one of them was to allow all of them on this particular VLAN or that particular VLAN on the trunk port. Convert a configured port with port security with a static or sticky secure address to a router port or hot swap it out of the system it will make the configuration of the port ineffective. In other words, we have a layer two port. We put MAC stuff on it, MAC addresses on it, layer two addresses on it, and then we say, hey, I want you to be a layer three port. Well, layer three ports don't really care about MAC addresses. They care about IP addresses. If we go back to the layer two, that configuration should still be there. And that's what the next one, if it layer two is restored when the port is either converted back to the, the uh, uh, layer 2 switch port or hot swapped into the system, the software will retain the configuration information for it. Uh, when a port is made available, the software ensures that the configured static or sticky secure addresses are not secured on other ports. And when we did the, uh, did the, uh, moved, moved the device from one port to the other on the uh, ones that were configured with port security, it automatically moved its MAC address to that port. And it didn't show up on the uh, on the initial port that we had. Issues with inter VLAN routing. Can we get the information from one to the other? Mismatch in the trunk encapsulation. Okay, we'll go with that. That's going to be hard because right now on layer two switches, the ones that we have, 802.1Q is the only uh, encapsulation protocol that you're going to see. That would be if we had 802.1Q on one end and ISL on the other end. Incorrect VLAN assignments configured on the on a router's interfaces. Uh, we when we did the router on a stick, we had to tell the system which VLAN was associated with that configuration with that IP address. Uh, incorrect IP address subnet mask on the router's interfaces. All things easy to do. Again, a reason to opinion to use the same number, the VLAN number, the network number, the VLAN number, all the same, so that when you do these sorts of, uh, of configurations, it's, you don't have, to, you don't have to, to do as much work, mental work, in order to keep the things sorted out. Incorrect, and say, incorrect IP addresses, incorrect IP address, subnet mask, or default gateway configured on the PCs. That always can be an issue. Hopefully we're using DHCP and we've got that right and we don't have those issues. Uh, Maybe connected, switch port connected to a router that's configured as an access port. It had to be a trunk port in order to send all of the, uh, all of the VLANs up to the router to, to uh, be routed within that single interface. Switch port connected to the router that is configured to DTP, the dynamic trunking protocol, not supported by the router. The router does not support uh, DTP, dynamic trunking protocol. And, you know, we, I guess that, that we could, we could make it uh, di dynamic, desirable, and expect it to happen, but you gotta have the, the manual uh, switch port mode trunk on the one that goes to the uh, router on a stick connect, uh, stick connector interface. Switch, switch ports connected 
to the PCs in the wrong VLAN. VLAN issues, ping, show interface status, VLAN assignments, uh, show interfaces, trunk command to be sure we have those, ping commands not successfully executed between the devices on the different VLANs, ping the default gateway, can we get there, ping the next default gateway, are we going from one to the other, and this is all the configuration with the show commands that, that we have to come back and look at to be sure that we're we're going from one to the other. Uh, ensure that the gateway of the device is pointing to the IP address of the correct VLAN interface. Again, easy things to do. And do and the, the, the correct one here, back to the do we have that port on the correct VLAN. Uh, got everything, all the configurations correct, but we're on the wrong VLAN. We're not going to go anywhere. Uh, check the default route by issuing the show IP interface command when we do that show IP route to see what's going on with those things. Console issues. The console is the thing that we plug into with these things and that the, that the correct COM port is selected. This used to be pretty easy because we had like uh, two serial ports, right? COM, COM1 and COM2. Now you don't really have serial ports on these devices. Uh, although some of them are coming back, I just got a machine the other day and it actually has a serial port on it. Uh, they may have been ordered that way. But uh, you, you may have to get a USB connector, USB to serial. For This is for the console port, to, for the rollover cable to get to the console port on the device itself. And you're going to have to then pick which one of these and, and it's usually the last one, the last connector that's there when you connect to it with putty or, or whatever we're going to use to do these things. Let's see. A putty here real quick. When we do this, this thing allows us to do, the, if we connect to the serial port, COM1, which COM line are we going to connect to? Which communication line to get from us to it to connect to the wire itself? when we do those things. SSHR, login, telnet, for all, all the things that are available on this thing. So the COM port, we've got to pick. And with the new ones, you know, we've got to, and sometimes, sometimes you just have to keep going until you get there. You connect it and hit the enter key a couple of times, nothing happens on the screen. Then you go to the next one, pick the next COM port on down the line after, after you look at them. The last one in here, the last one listed is usually the correct one to use. Not always, but usually when we do those things. Terminal program settings are correct. 9600 baud, 8 data bits, 1 stop bit, no parity. And again, when you do the configuration labs on the CCNA test, you have to go through this. And you'll go through and look at the configuration the ones that I've done, the, the times that I have done these, yeah, you've got to go through it, but they've never had it misconfigured. So, and then we had the authentication, local username and password are used to authenticate, to access the console. Just like we did with the VTY lines this morning, you can do the same thing with LineCon0, login local if you want to force users to log in. Some courses, the labs do that, and I've always thought that was, you know, after you learn how to do those things, that to me that just slows things down, but that's just me. Uh, check the AAA server is used to authenticate access to the console port. And here's something else we haven't done yet. AAA server, radius server, we'll configure those in ICND2 to, to be used for authentication, you know, for Telnet or for uh, the console connection whatever we want to use it for, 802.1x, different uh, things to authenticate. We'll have a central authentication server for those things. Troubleshoot Telnet access to the device. Again, can we ping it? Can we get to it? The IP address is reachable. Uh, the transport protocols are defined correctly. And a couple of things that we looked at, the default on the uh, VTY line on the, on the device itself is login which says that we have to log in, but no password. And, and when I did the, the, the uh, packet tracer, it just said no. What you get in real life, unless they've changed it, is that login is required, but no password set. So it really tells you that, hey, I gotta go set a password on this VTY line. The transport protocols are defined correctly. Transport protocols, Telnet or SSH. SSH, the correct versions are available on it. 
uh, check whether the telnet's configured to ask for credentials. Login local would do that. Uh, to log the, the login command will prompt the user for a password. You need to authenticate the user through a local database with the login local when we do that. And then again, the default configuration is just login without the password. And without the password, the, the message down there, password required but none set down here, is the message that you really should get back if that in case is, is in fact, is the case, in case is the fact, yeah. So, uh, troubleshooting Telnet access control lists again. Down here, the IP access list one denied IP address is displayed for these things. Uh, the explicit deny entry in the ACL. If the VT1 lines are busy, all of them are busy, you're not going to be able to get on. VTY04 in a switch, there's usually 15 telnet lines. In a router, there's usually 4 telnet lines. And they're broken out, VTY04 and then VTY515. You can configure them all at the same time with line VTY015, and, and the configurations will go to all of the uh, 15 lines. And then that means that, hey, I want to be able to have... Uh, 16 connections to my device. You may not want that. So how many of these things are you going to configure? And if you and if you don't configure the other ones, you just do login without the password, nothing's going to happen. Nobody's going to be able to get there. But you can run out of connections. Uh, some devices have uh, more VTY lines. You have the, the, the switches that we saw, password required but not set. If you do these things, with the commands here are clear line command, uh, if you need to man manually clear the lines, uh, check whether the access control list is blocking port 23, and we have had access control list on all of these things. Telnet TCP port 23 is what it uses, and we have to have connection through the firewall or the router, whatever we're going to do, that we can't have that port blocked and still be able to, uh, uh, to get from one to the other. SSH access, similar thing here, SSH uses port 22, but the SSH version, is it correct, show IP SSH uh, to view the version of SSH that's being in use, that is in use, they need to match, uh, verify that the correct login command has been specified, SSH uses a username and password for authentication, and again, when we looked at PuTTY there, PuTTY had the uh, the ability we could use SSH with it. Putty again. When we go over to it, we have SSH. SSH here is the default host name or IP address, and then when we get there, we will get the login information. And you can you can configure stuff over here to make the uh, the text bigger and those sorts of things. But the default is going to be 22. And Telnet here going to come out to 23. So you can, we can see those particular default ports. The correct login. Additional issues, key size. The, and this is the correct key size. SSH2 uses a key size of 768 or above. Uh, one, version 1 may have a smaller key size and, and then if we go from one to the other, the key is going to be too small and it's not going to work. Uh, create a, I mean, it may need to, again, create the, 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 the way out of that, create a new key. Again, check to see if there's an access control list. TCP port 22 for SSH. Password encryption issues. By default, all the passwords are stored in clear text, except for the enabled secret password, which is MD5. And these are the ones that we looked at a couple of times. The default is no service password encryption. When we do service password encryption, all those that were in clear text are now encrypted with type 7. In order to implement a type 4 encryption, you need to use the secret keyword when specifying a password. Secret, and actually not 4, but uh, type 5 right now on most of them. Uh, the newer ones, and up here type 4, it, and it really did mean type 4, but right now most of them are type 5. Type 4 uses a SHA-256, which is a much bigger, longer uh, system or longer hash. Do real quick, we're, get, we're getting there. Uh, a, a hash here 
just just to have something I don't want to file here. I want a, a text string. So when we do a calculate here, the 256 here is substantially longer than going to be harder to generate, harder to, to, uh, to guess, to, to calculate than the MD5 hash is. And is there an MD4? The 4 here is a, is a type, not the message digest. So a 4 indicates SHA-256, a 5 MD5, while 7 indicates a type 7 is used. Uh, the levels from strongest to the weakest, 4, 5, 7, and then 0. 0 is no encryption at all on that. The secret 5, and actually when I do secret 5, it, it, uses, it uses 5 as part of the password. Secret will do that just like in the enable secret that we use. Log events, the, the log files allow you, us to identify issues that show logging. Uh, allows to, to view the state of the logging system. Uh, syslog, syslog stores the uh, logs on a syslog server, piece of software running on a workstation. Gives us the ability to keep them there to do log analysis after we have after we have them. Uh, issue log messages in response to different events. We've looked at some of those. Uh, default setting, it sends them to the console port uh, and that logging synchronous at the console port is, is something that you may want to do so that we, you do something and you get a log message about the time you start typing a command and it splits your command on different lines. Logging synchronous will keep everything on the same line. The key points, see we, we got here. Uh, the router needs an IP name server DNS address to configure the router to use DNS name resolution. Explicitly configure a router to act as a relay agent if it is someplace not directly connected to the DHCP server. If it has a router between it and the uh, DHCP server, it's not going to get there because routers don't pass uh, broadcast messages and half of the DHCP messages are show interface Ethernet to view the number of times the collisions have occurred IP config on the workstations to see what our IP address is default gateway subnet mask IP config all to give other information including the IPv6 configuration in the end connectivity becomes a problem ensure that we can ping our own interface, ping something else on our network, ping the default gateway, ping something on the other side of the default gateway. That is layer three. That doesn't mean that if we're trying to get to a web server and we can ping the IP address that the web server service is running. We have to use Telnet to do that, to Telnet to a service. Violation mode uh, port can be an error disabled or set to shutdown mode or the packets from an unsecure address can be dropped in the software or restrict mode and then the service password encryption no service password encryption is the default not a very strong uh, encapsulation or encapsulation uh, encryption protocol but it's there if you want to use it the md5 the type 4 the sha 256 is the one that we obviously would rather use